Um, so, so I don't have time to go back and explain. Um, I'll, I'll say this real quick. Uh, we saw last week that uh, Mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 20 uh, were not words written by Mark, but they were written by someone else. Um, but we believe that they are the very word of God, uh, that they fit in the category of all scripture is inspired by God. And so therefore, uh, we're able to trust these verses and, and preach and teach them uh, as we would any other verse in the Bible. Now, you might be going, oh, who wrote those verses? I, I, I don't know. Um, I've searched. I, I don't know. There are some theories, but uh, uh, I prefer to just say I, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that they are the words of God. All right, they come from our Heavenly Father, and so we are to unpack them, uh, seeking to understand what it is that God wants to say to us. Uh, let me say this as well as uh, before we launch in. Um, verses 9 to 20, one of the other reasons that we can say that they are the Word of God is that they don't contradict the Word of God. Uh, you'll see here in a moment uh, that if you're familiar with the other Gospels, you'll go, hold on, I've seen that before, I've heard that before. It's because they don't contradict the Bible. And so uh, here's my theory, right? Let me stand here away from the text and everything. Here's my theory. I believe the person that wrote these uh, looked at the book of Mark, looked at the other uh, gospels and was like, mm, they don't they don't end the same, right? And so wondering, uh, remember back then they didn't have the Bible. They just had manuscripts. And so you didn't know uh, which region was going to get which manuscript. And so uh, I figure he went, okay, listen, just to give some consistency here, I've read the other gospels. Let me, let me write these verses out so that folks might know how the story ends in the other gospels. That's what I believe, right? But having said that, I still believe that they are the words of God. They do not contradict the Bible. And so because of that, I'm going to preach them, and I'm going to preach them faithfully. Uh, that is my heart. Uh, that is what I have been praying this last week. And so let me, let me read the text. I'll read it to us. Uh, I'll read it again because I read it last week. But let me uh, read it again, and, uh, and then I'll pray. I'll pray briefly, and then we'll jump into God's Word. All right, so Mark... Chapter 16, uh, from verse 9. Hear these words of our Father. It says, Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, this is Jesus, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. After this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported it to the rest who did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. Then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned." And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. So the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the accompanying Signs. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that uh, you would be with us this morning, uh, that you would meet us where we are, that you would engage our hearts. And so would you open up our ears so that we might hear from you, open up our minds so that we might understand, open up our hearts so that we might be reconciled and restored. Lord, I pray that you would redeem. This time belongs to you. I ask that you would stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your, your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 9. It says, Early... On the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. I think we should start by asking, who's Mary? 
Who is this Mary? See, Mary Magdalene was from an area called Magdala. Magdalene was not her last name. It was not her surname. It was communicating where she was from. And so a small area called Magdala, a small Galilean town. Now, now most of us, when we think of Mary, we, we probably think prostitute. At least uh, that's what I thought. Uh, we think uh, temptress. Because we're told this. Uh, whether it's in a Bible study somewhere or, or a movie that has been made, they portray uh, Mary as a, a prostitute. However, there is no evidence in any of the four Gospels of this. There are about seven mentions of Mary Magdalene in the four Gospels, and in none of them is there an indication that she engaged in prostitution, that she was in some form of adultery or some sexual misdemeanor. There's no evidence of that. What we are told in the scriptures is that she uh, was a woman who was tormented by seven demons and that she was healed by Jesus. We're told in the scriptures that she uh, became one of Jesus' followers among many other women who supported Jesus' ministry. They supported Jesus' ministry with resources. We see this in Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3. We're also told that Mary was the first eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection. That's what we are told in the scriptures. And so this begs the question, how did Mary Magdalene get such a reputation of being a prostitute? Where does that come from? Now, I could I could unpack that from a particular bishop who preached it and was trying to make sense of it all, but let me not go there. Let me rather say this. I believe that that reputation came to her because of where she was from. Because of where she was from. Like I said, she was from a small area called Magdala, which was known for uh, its fine fabrics, its uh, beautiful feathers, uh, uh, fishing, and also for fallen women, as they would say. It was known as the Red Light District of its time. See, Mary was from a bad town. She had a shady history. We're told that she's the only demon-possessed person in the Bible who is named. She's the only one. And whose demons are numbered seven. There were seven of them. Uh, which is quite significant because if you, if you uh, know the scriptures, uh, you would know that the, the, the number seven is an important number. It speaks of perfection. But here we, we see it in the negative that there were seven demons. I want you to feel the gravity here, the weightiness of the soul. But let's go back to uh, the town that she was from. History tells us that the, the Roman soldiers would often go to Magdala And they would take advantage of the women there. See, they they would leave their posts and then go to this town and then do whatever they wanted there with the women. Now, this was very difficult. Very difficult for women back then because, because if you had been taken advantage of, then you were seen as unclean. And so life became very difficult for you as a woman. But it was not It was not a choice that they made. It was because of something that had been done to them. And so this town was was known as a a place where you could go and and do whatever you wanted. It was almost like the Las Vegas of our time. And so she carried this. On top of seven demons, she carried this reputation. But I want to be honest here this morning because I, we don't know if she was a victim of this abuse. We don't. The text doesn't tell us. We don't know if her life was full of brokenness because of this abuse. But what we do know is that she was tortured by seven demons. Why am I telling you this? Why, why, why am I telling you about the seven demons and also painting a picture of where she was from? Why is this significant? Well, I tell you this because it doesn't matter where you are from. 
It doesn't matter what your reputation is. It doesn't matter what you have done or what's been done to you. Hear this, Jesus can heal you. Jesus can heal you. Jesus healed Mary Magdalene and she was then faithful to him. Friends, I want you to know that Jesus is not worried about your history. We live in a society that is very, very concerned about history. Jesus is not worried about your history. He's not afraid of the demons in your life. He's not. Even if there are seven. Jesus knows it all. And he still longs to heal you. He longs to heal you. He longs to make you whole. He desires to have you follow him. See, so many of us, we we go, but you know, if you knew my life, if you you knew what had happened to me, Jesus does. I want you to know this morning that he does and still he longs to make you whole. And so the question is, will you let him? Will you follow him? Will you lay it all down? Will you allow Jesus to rewrite your story? But let's keep reading verse 12. After this, this after appearing to Mary, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported it to the rest who did not believe them either. Uh, let's jump to, to Luke, uh, where uh, Luke paints a, a, a broader picture of what was happening here. We're only given two verses here, but Luke unpacks it all. And so Luke uh, 24 from verse 13. Yeah, there we go. And we're literally just going to walk through it. right? I want to see you what's going on here and then point you to what I believe the Scripture wants us to see. So verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles, about 11 kilometers uh, from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near. I love that. Jesus came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Other translations say that, that it was God who prevented uh, them from recognizing Jesus. Right? So um, they were prevented from recognizing him, verse 17. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened in these last days? What things, he asked them. Gosh, I love it when Jesus does this. In fact, I love it when the Bible does this. See, when Jesus asks questions, he's asking because he he wants you to see something in your life. He's not asking because he has no idea what's going on. It's like God in the garden when he says, Adam, where are you? It's not like us when we've, we've lost our car keys and we're like, oh, Adam, where did you go? No, no, he's saying, Adam, where are you? I want you to recognize where you are. What things, he asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are. The language is strong here. How foolish 
you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Concerning himself in all the scriptures. But what's happening here? Well, we're being told that all of scripture points to Jesus. That's, that's what's happening here. All of scripture points to Jesus. In fact, uh, Jesus would later say the same thing, but more explicit uh, in the same chapter, Luke 24, verse uh, 44 to 46. It says, then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. It couldn't be more clearer. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's what Jesus does. Jesus, he opens up our minds so that we might understand the scriptures. If you're, if you're wrestling with a particular text, go to Jesus. Ask him to open up your mind so that you might understand. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. John's uh, gospel account of Jesus tells us that from the very onset of Jesus' ministry, he taught that he was central to the Old Testament. Scripture, all of Scripture points to Jesus. We're told in John chapter 5, verses 39 to 40, Jesus says, you diligently study the Scriptures, he told the Pharisees, because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You diligently study the scriptures, but you're missing it. You're missing it. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Jesus says. And so manna from heaven points to Jesus as the bread of life. Water from the rock that quenched the thirst of the Israelites points to Jesus as the living water to satisfy our spiritual lives. A pillar of cloud by day to provide shadow for, from the heat and a pillar of fire by night to provide light in the darkness all points to Jesus. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. And so if you are reading and you are wrestling, then cry out to him so that you might understand. But, but let's go back to the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. Verse 28, they came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going farther. Is that, is that right? Is it farther, further, farther? You guys also don't know. No one knows. It's a mystery. They, they wait. He gave the impression that he was going a little bit uh, longer. There we go. There we go. Verse 29, but they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening. That's important, don't keep that in the back of your mind. It's almost evening. And now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table. Oh, friends, I, I, wish, I wish we had time. I wish, I know some of you guys got lunch after this and got some amazing plans, but I wish we had time. We could literally just unpack word after word after word, the significance of the table. The table. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Uh, at the beginning of last year, we did a series and we titled it The Table where we looked at, at how Jesus calls us to a table to fellowship with him and then to fellowship with others. Jesus is a blessing who was broken for us and then given to the world. And so he does this. He does this with these two disciples. And then we're told, verse 31, then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. From this one act of Jesus, it's like, oh my goodness, I see who he is. It's by being at the table. 
This morning, Jesus is inviting you to the table, to fellowship with him, to be reconciled back to the Father, to fellowship with him so that we might also fellowship with others. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That the more Jesus opened up the word, the faster their pulses raced. Imagine Jesus opening up the word and unpacking nugget after nugget after nugget with you. Went our hearts burning within us. So verse 33, that very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. That very hour. See, after realizing who Jesus was and what he had done for them, they got up and within the hour they were returning to Jerusalem. Two, two things here, two quick things here. Number one is that uh, we see after an encounter with Jesus, two souls were left flaming with passion for the things of God. We saw this last week. And we asked the question, are you in awe and wonder of Jesus? Have you had an encounter with Jesus? Because if you are, you're like these two disciples, left flaming with passion for the things of God. How how do we know? How do we know that this was a, a good passion? Well, sensible Palestinians would not travel lonely roads at night. Remember, I told you to remember it was evening. And they invite Jesus in. They have a meal. It's now nighttime. And yet when their eyes are open to who Jesus is and they are filled with awe and wonder, they're like, pack our bags, we need to go back. And so sensible Palestinians wouldn't do that for fear of thieves and robbers. But the two disciples could not keep their news to themselves. If you want to know if you've had an encounter with Jesus, if you want to know if you understand the beauty of the gospel, you're left with this this desire to share the good news with others. More than the desire to, to share the great movie you just watched more than the desire to share with others the great restaurant that you went to. I know we all do that. So it's not a question of like, well, you know, I just, I don't know, and I, 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 I'm not 100% sure, I'm not that kind of person. No, you are. If you're going to tell me anything that you have recently enjoyed, and you just want to share it with as many people as you can, then the question is, have you had an encounter with Jesus? That's number one. Number two is, did you notice that the two disciples were going away from Jerusalem? They were heading to Emmaus. They were going in the wrong direction. Don't miss it. They were going in the wrong direction. Friends, we are all going in the wrong direction before we meet Jesus. Each and every one of us. We are all going in the wrong direction. But Jesus meets us where we are. He meets us where we are. And then he redirects us back to the Father heart of God. And for those who cross the line of faith, for those who surrender their lives to Jesus, he then deposits the Holy Spirit in us who becomes our heavenly GPS. And that GPS, every time you go, uh, let me go this way, it goes, no, no, recalculating. No, no, I think I should be heading towards success because that's what will give me life and meaning. Recalculating. Maybe it's relationships. Recalculating. For some of us, being here this very morning, is it's the Holy Spirit recalculating in your lives. But you're going in the wrong direction. And you, you've tried everything. You've tried to, to, to turn up the volume to the music so you don't hear the Holy Spirit. You've tried to, to shut down the GPS so you don't hear from the Holy Spirit. He is constant recalculating, recalculate, recalc- He wants to recalculate your marriage, your, your, your relationship with others. Do 
Jesus meets you where you are. He comes near. He's close. He wants to take you back to the Father heart of God. But let's go back to our text in Mark 16. That's where we'll camp out for a little bit. But I want you to forget this, that that Jesus doesn't care where you come from. He doesn't care about your reputation. Because those are some of the things that are holding us back from experiencing the fullness of God. We're going to do a series in Exodus after this. We're going to spend about 10, um, 10 sermons in Exodus. It's going to be incredible. And, um, and I think for many of us, we are, we've crossed the line of faith and we trust Jesus. And so in many ways, we're, we're, we're going towards the promised land, right? The heavenly promised land. You read Hebrews, it unpacks it for us. But, but I think we're, we're here but for many of us, our emotions are still stuck in Egypt. For, for, for many of us, we're going, no, 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 I'm, I'm going towards the, the, the promised land, but my relationships are still stuck in Egypt. Don't let those things hold you back from experiencing the fullness of who God is. And also listen to the Holy Spirit. Scripture says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He's recalculating. He brings you into community to recalculate you. He leads you into that uncomfortable conversation about the sin in your life because he's recalculating. He's calling out the idols in your life that you have created because of fear calling you to repent and to trust Jesus. Let's go back to Mark 16, verse 14. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. Then he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. Now this portion of the text is a familiar one. It's a familiar one because it should remind us of the Great Commission. It should remind us of the mission that Jesus commands his followers to go on. Go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. The forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, Luke 24, verse 46 to 49. Just as the Father has sent me, I am sending you, John 20, verses 19 to 23. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me where? Everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This portion of scripture points to the Great Commission, but it also tells us something important. It tells us that there is no such thing as a nominal Christian. There is no such thing as a nominal Christian. Hey, hey I, just, I just show up and sit and relax and have someone unpack the scriptures to me and then I go and do whatever it is that I want to do and I'm still a Christian. I, I don't need to follow uh, all the things that are here. I, man, it's not about that. We, we hear this all the time. There is no such thing, hear me, hear me, there is no such thing as a nominal Christian. Our salvation desires obedience. It desires obedience. This is why right out the gates we see Jesus saying, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be saved. Condemned. Now, 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 this portion of scripture has has, has brought a lot of questions, uh, and, and people are going. So, so is Jesus saying that uh, you have to be baptized to be saved? 
No. That's not what it means. We are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2. Grace alone, faith alone. I want us to look closely at the text. Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Where is the emphasis? Where is it? Believe. It's in believing. In the Greek, this word is pisteo. Pisteo, which means to have strong confidence or reliance upon something or someone. The call is to believe. John 3.16. I'm pretty sure most of us know it. For this is how God loved the world. Say it with me if you know it. He gave his one and only son. Oh, no. Okay. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish. Thank you. But have you turned a laugh? Move over here. I appreciate it. No. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes, Pisteo, who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Let me give you an amazing, uh, uh, I want to say trick, but that's not the right word, uh, to unpacking the scriptures. You guys ready? It's a nugget. It's going to blow your minds. It's going to blow your minds. You ready? When you read a verse, read more. Are you blown away? See, many of us, we, we stop at, at verse 16 and we go, that's, that's it. But, but let's read further. It says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. The emphasis is believing. However, having said that, once we are saved, we are moved towards obedience to the Father through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace alone and faith alone, but but, but for those who've crossed the line of faith, we are now compelled to a life of obedience. And so right out the gates, we're told, okay, then be baptized. Then be baptized. This is why we see often in the book of Acts, people being saved and then being baptized. Repent and be baptized, Peter says. See, baptism is an outward picture of an inward reality. I believe this is why it is communicated as the first act of obedience to the Father. You are saved. Okay, now go be baptized. Go be baptized. It's a public declaration that my life is now in Christ. And so the question is, have you been baptized? If you say that you believe, have you been baptized? Baptized. Now I get it. We want to make sure that people understand what baptism is and, and how it fits in our life. All of that is important, but, but don't live in disobedience. See, it's from this act of being baptized, of taking this step of obedience, that a life of obedience begins. Obedience to the great commandment, obedience to the great commission. The Christian life is is one of obedience to the Father. This is why we can say that there is no such thing as a nominal Christian. Friends, that doesn't exist. I know some of you might be going, I know that's a little judgy. Don't judge me. I'm not saying this to judge you. I'm saying this to warn you. I'm saying this to warn you. Because you may think that you're a Christian. You may think that you are right with God, but you're not. James says, faith without works is dead. My fear is that there are so many people 
So many people who believe that they have a relationship with Jesus, but actually don't. They've been sold a lie. They've been told, come to Jesus, sit back, do whatever you want. You've got your ticket to heaven, we'll see you there. And the reality is that faith compels us to obedience. We don't get it right. We're not perfect. I get that. There is grace for that. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. But it's a life of obedience. And so verses 14 to 18 tell us that there is no such thing as a nominal Christian. But it also tells us something else. You see, in this passage, we see some interesting miracles. Right? I know you guys have been waiting for this. When is he going to get to that part? When? Ah, he's taking too long. There's some interesting miracles here. We're told, in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. Jonah, can you release the snakes now? No, no. <laughs> they will not harm. The, oh, they should drink. If they drink, if they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. Now, I believe this is where people usually get stuck. This is where many snake handling ministries have been started. This is where some cults have been born, where we hear of people drinking poison to prove that they carry the power of God. That's not what this text is about. Now, let me be clear. I believe in the supernatural. I do. I believe in the supernatural power of God. Therefore, I believe in miracles. I believe in signs and wonders. I, I do. I, I just do. And, and here at Rooted, we, we say this. We believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all of them. From the gift of wisdom to the gift of tongues. From the gift of service and administration to the gift of prophecy and healing. And we should pray for those. We should. I believe it because when Jesus says all authority has been given to him, and then he sends us out with this authority, I also believe that he means it. All authority. All authority. And so we should, we should pray for the supernatural. There may be right here in this very room, there are people who are waiting on God for the supernatural. You're waiting on God for supernatural healing. You're waiting on God for a prophetic word. So, Father, I feel compelled to pray. I feel the weightiness of so many people in this room who are just who are waiting. They 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 maybe know of loved ones, maybe themselves. They they they're waiting on a, on supernatural healing to come from your very hand. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet them where they are. Just as we've seen in the text, Jesus, you love to do that. You love to come near, so would you meet them where they are? But if that is not what you have chosen for them, Lord, I pray that you would reveal it to them in another way. You're a God who is good. You're a God who is faithful. And so, Lord, I pray that you would touch those who need to experience your presence right here, right now in this very moment. Would your spirit be poured out on them in such a profound way that they cannot, they cannot, even if they try, they cannot turn away from you. Help us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, I believe in the supernatural. I really do. And yet having said that, I want you to know that miracles are not the end. They are a means to the end, but they themselves are not the end. They point to something greater. They point to the kingdom of God. They point to how the kingdom of God functions, and it should leave us with the question, how then do I get access to this kingdom? That is why we see signs and wonders. People being raised from the dead 
is incredible. It should point to the kingdom of God. It is not the end. It's a means to the end. Here's why. Because at some point, that person is going to die. We pray for supernatural healing. And that is not, it's not the end. It points to the end. It's a means to the end. Because at some point in your life, you're going to get the cold. You're going to get the flu. It points us to the kingdom and how the kingdom functions. And it should leave us with this, how then do I get access to this kingdom? And the answer is Jesus and Jesus alone. Look with me in verse 10. No, it's not up on the screen. I'll read it to you. Verse, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Um, this is after Jesus has sent out the 72 disciples. He sends them out uh, on mission uh, and they come back with an amazing report. Hear this. Uh, Luke chapter 10 from verse 17. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Even the demons submit to us in your name. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. Verse 20, however, Jesus says. The English standard version says, nevertheless, the New Living Translation says, but... But don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He, he, he points them to something greater. He's like, this is, this is incredible. And yes, I've given you authority to go and do this. But don't, don't settle for that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What is Jesus saying here? What is Mark 16, verse 14 to 18 saying? In fact, what is the Bible saying to us over and over and over again? Hear this. Miracles are great, friends. Miracles are phenomenal. They're amazing. We pray for them. But only the gospel can transform the unbelieving heart. Only the gospel can move someone from unbelief to belief, from darkness to light, from orphan to child. Only the gospel. I mean, I think of the... the The Israelites, and I'm I'm giving a trailer, attraction, teaser, whatever you want to call it to our our series in Exodus. The, the, The people of God, they come out of Egypt. I mean, think about it. Miracle after miracle after miracle. You got, you got to see the, the, the Red Sea part. Like, how phenomenal is that? To be able to, to walk. Imagine the stories. Guys, did you see that, that fish? No, but did you see that whale? Like, incredible. Did you, it, like, I literally, I could touch it. It was amazing to see manna fall from the heavens and to taste, like, Miracle after miracle after miracle. And still we're told that they grumbled. Only the gospel can transform an unbelieving heart. John 20 verse 29 to 31. Jesus is speaking to Thomas after he was like, no, 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 no. I I won't believe until I can put my fingers in the holes. And then he does it. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, that's us. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Friends, this is why we do what we do. We don't don't gather because we think this is a really cool book club. We gather because we want to hear from Jesus. We, We want hearts, unbelieving hearts, to be transformed. We want people to recognize that they are loved more than they could ever imagine because of the finished work of Jesus. We want those who've crossed the line of faith to to recognize that they they can experience the benefits of the kingdom here today. I understand we live in the already, but not yet. But recognize the already. That he is restoring. That he is reconciling. That he is healing. Mind, body, and soul. 
so that we might have life in him. So I, I close this sermon by pointing us to the one who gives life and life to the full. I pray this every Sunday. I pray that, that folks would leave here changed. That folks would leave here transformed. That folks would leave here with more hope. Because it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long for you to be bombarded with the things of this world. My hope is that you would look at those things and go, I'm going to be okay. I know how the story ends. My name is written in the book of life. Jesus knows me. He knows my name. He knows my circumstances. He knows what's going on. He knows what I'm hoping for. He knows what keeps me up at night. He knows uh, about the things that I cry over. He knows it all. He is near to you. You are loved more than you could ever imagine. For some of us, that sounds strange because we've grown up being rejected. And yet Ephesians tells us you are chosen. Before he created the world that we marvel at, he had you in mind. That you are adopted. Yes, you are an orphan with with no hope and no future, with nothing, and yet he brings you in. That you are redeemed. All the brokenness in your life. Jesus is the master carpenter. He takes broken pieces, insignificant pieces, and he makes something incredible. You have an inheritance. Gosh, I wish I had time to unpack what that means. I mean, for many of us, we go inheritance. What on earth is that? All right? What earthly inheritance do I have? Many of us, we, we, we go, I am the inheritance. And yet, here we're told that, that, that there, is, there is something waiting for us that is imperishable, Peter writes. And then lastly, you are sealed. God is not holding the receipt, waiting for your brokenness to then say, you know what, I'm taking this back. It's not working. He's he's not doing, we do that. We hold on to the box because we're like, if this thing doesn't work, I'm taking it back. God is like, no, no, no. You are covered in the blood of my son. The same blood that rescues is the same blood that heals and restores and comforts. You are sealed. We rejoice that our names have been written in the book of life. And if you know that your name is not there, this morning is an opportunity for you to, to lay it all down and say, you know what, I'm, Jesus, I need you. There's no steps to this. There's no program. It's just surrendering. It's just believing. And so, Father God, I pray that, that we would believe that we would be counted among those who believe, those who've gone before us, those who are with us currently. But Jesus, you died for the church. And so, Father, I pray that we, we would believe that. Holy Spirit, you would give us the strength to push away the things that are telling us that that, that's true, that that's not really what God wants for us. Holy Spirit, give us strength to stand before you and to look to you and to know that you are our Father. I pray for those who are wrestling, they're wrestling to believe. We saw this last week. I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I pray that you would give supernatural supernatural belief. We come to you as the giver of everything. 
Help us, Lord. Help us. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.